If you want to hear a pretty descriptive first-hand account of a band member of Bob Wills and his Texas Playboys, consider the following interview with Danny Alguire, a trumpet player who was with the Bob Wills Band from 1941 to 1942. His vivid memories of his time with the group are well worth listening to. This interview was recorded on December 15, 1970 in Los Angeles, California. Danny Alguire, who was born in 1912, is remembered for his only vocal performance with the group, and his, the song was Home in San Antonio, which was recorded on July 14, 1942. He gives a good account of how that recording came about. World War II temporarily broke up Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys, but by the time Bob had formed a new band after a little more than a few months with the armed forces, Danny Alguire had already joined the Navy. When the war was over, Danny Alguire was soon playing trumpet with a T. Texas Tyler band in the Los Angeles area. After a few years of that life, and wanting one where he wasn't on the road all the time, he became a fingerprint expert with the Los Angeles Police Department. Then he became a member of the Dixieland Jazz Band, the Firehouse Five Plus Two all of whom consisted of Walt Disney employees. Alguire soon joined the Disney organization where he became an assistant director, doing mostly cartoon work. He remained with the jazz band from 1949 until 1971. He retired to Portland, Oregon, where he died in 1992. But as he says in this interview, throughout all his years, he never had more fun than his year playing with Bob Wills and his Texas Playboys. The audio is a little rough in spots, but it is quite informative. His time with the Bob Wills organization begins about 30 minutes into the interview. The whole interview lasts just a little over two hours. Do me a favor and click on the red subscribe button below. YouTube will never bother you with any emails. They just want to know if you're watching my videos or not. But if you ring the bell, you will receive a notification when we upload a new video. It's your choice. And with that out of the way, here we go. Uh, this recording is being made at the uh, Studio City uh, home of uh, Danny Alguire on December 15, 1970. Danny, if we could, we'd like to get your full and complete name. Uh... <clears throat> I don't bandy this about much, but my full name is Reuben Daniel Alguire. Alguire. And that's A-L-G-U-I-R-E? That's right. All right. What is the extraction of Alguire? What is uh, the, it is sounds it? Irish, doesn't it? I really don't Especially know. It's Danny Alguire. It sounds like it, yes. No, it's originally German. I see. Uh, my father's side of the family. Uh, uh, first Alguire that came to America was a German immigrant. And he spelled his name A double L G E Y E R Algar. I see. And he came direct to Germany and landed in New York. And with his family moved up into the Mohawk Valley, mm. central New York. I see. But through the years, uh, mm. through church records and miswriting, it evolved into Algar. Mm. Uh, where were you uh, born, Danny? Born in Chickasha, Oklahoma. I see. And what was the date? Uh, August 30th, 1912. 1912. And what was the name of your uh, father and your mother's maiden name? Uh, my father's name was George Burt Alguire. At B-U-R-T? At B-U-R-T. And my mother's name was Bessie Tye, T-Y-E. And that's straight English all the way back. Uh, my mother and all the distaff side of our family are daughters of the American Revolution. Oh, is that right? Oh, yes. 
Uh, Dan, uh, would you be good enough to give us uh, a background as far as your uh, father and mother are concerned uh, as to whether they had any interest in uh, music? Well, I think first I could bring you from New York to Oklahoma the last I told you that my uh, great ancestors uh, lived in New York State. Well, when the Revolutionary War broke out, uh, they sided with the side of the crown. Uh, they were called Tories. They fled to Canada. And um, so all the Alguars grew up in Canada. My grandfather, my father's father, was born in Thousand Islands on the St. Lawrence River. And at a young age, he uh, took a wife in Wisconsin who was English, uh, Margaret Barningham. <laughs> That's pretty English. And they homesteaded North Dakota at Sioux Falls, right outside of the town of Sioux Falls. And in 19, uh, and I'm not sure of this date, whenever they made the Cherokee Strip run in Oklahoma, my grandfather and my father came down to make the run. And they got some land in Grady County, Chickasha was the county seat. And that's how I kind of be born in Oklahoma. <laughs> Briefly. Very interesting. And so, I was, as I said, I was born in Chickasha, Oklahoma, August 30th, 1912. And my mother, my mother's father, was a doctor, and he delivered me. And uh, strangely enough, my father was a professional drummer. And on the night I was about to be born, he had a job to play. And along about 8 o'clock when he was due on the job, he was worried to death as to whether to go to the job or not. And my grandfather, the doctor, says, well, you can't do any good here. You might as well go play the job because God knows you need the money. <laughs> <laughs> so he went and played the job. And uh, later I asked him, I said, you must have played horrible that night. And he says, yeah, I was worried. But he came home after midnight. I think in those days the job only lasted 11 or 12. Nowadays we play the one or two, uh, but he came home, I was already born, had my dinner, and was fast asleep. Uh, now, uh, other than uh, the drum, did he uh, play any other instrument? Well, in those days, a drummer played a lot of things. I see. Uh, he was, uh, he played pit drums in theaters as well as dances. Mm -hmm. uh, he could play bells, uh, xylophones, uh, Kettle drums. Uh, in those days, drummers were percussionists. I see. And uh, I can remember when I was five years old in Chickasha, Oklahoma, going down to the old Suggs Theater and uh, sitting in the front row watching my dad play pit drums. And I was thrilled to death. Now, he played the bells and the xylophones. And of course, that was silent days. And, he caught all the tricks. A guy get hit on the head. He would catch a wood block and throw me to that. Uh, what type of uh, performances would he give in those days? In other words, what, how did they play in, in just theaters or? Uh... Well, uh, I think at that time, uh, mostly he played uh, what they call pit drums. You know, uh, uh, provide the music for the silent pictures. I see. Did they Usually, there wasn't too many. Uh, small towns. I remember there was only about four pieces, like piano, drums, violin, and something else. Did they ever play for things like barn dances or go out into the, uh, you know? Uh, well, no. Uh, and you just brought this to my mind. Uh, they just played uh, the music of the day, as I remember. I don't remember this. Uh, Western, I, uh, looking back now, I thought it was very professional, mm -hmm. uh, legit, uh, legit. Right. Could be. Legit music was what it was, because I remember the piano player was all over this piano boy. I mean, it was uh, almost high class. <laughs> I see. Well, I, I don't know. Now, did they have uh, much country or folk music uh, in the area at that time? No. I, as such, I can't remember such a thing. Uh, at that time, talking about my dad playing pit drums, uh, that was legit. I mean, they read music, and it was pretty serious. And as, as country music as such, uh, I don't think so. 
Uh, did your mother have an interest in music? My mother had absolutely no musical talent. She couldn't keep time with her hands, couldn't carry tune in the basket, yeah, as he used right. to say. So it would have been just from your father? It must have been. Now, where did you uh, get your first interest? Uh, in well, my older brother George was musically talented, uh, and my older sister played piano. I think it'll be a good uh, place to get their names and the well, order. Well, uh, my my sister Bernice was the oldest. Then my brother George was the next oldest. Then uh, myself, and then uh, the youngest was uh, Robert. We called him Bud, mm -hmm. and he inherited his mother's talent <laughs> I see. and still does. And I kid him. He he's absolutely ten year. Okay. Tone deaf Is that right? and loves music more than anyone yeah. in the family. I, I can believe that. Yeah, I have got the it. best record collection yeah. of any of us. Uh, it sounds like myself. <laughs> uh, so, would you pick up again as far as what they did? Uh, well, uh, my mm -hmm. sister took up piano, uh, took lessons at an early age. My father, being a professional drummer, started my brother George. By this time, we had moved to Fort Worth, Texas. I see. About and, what age was uh, this? Uh, six. You, when you were 1918. six? 1918. But I don't think I started playing until I was about eight. I see. So what, 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 uh, what brought about the move? Huh? What brought about the move, do you recall? Well, my father thought we were old enough to uh, start. He, he loved music. He mm -hmm. thought that we had talent and wanted to start my brother George and myself on uh, playing. My little brother Bud was too young then. So he he uh, started my brother George on drums and taught him personally, mm -hmm. but he thought I ought to play a horn, and all he could show me he knew the he started me on mellophone, you know which looks like a French horn but it's an E flat instrument, and all he could show me was the scale. Then he enrolled both of us in the Fort Worth Rotary Club Boys Band, I see. and I was the youngest member of the band at eight years old. Right. My brother was about ten. And why did Bud take up? Or did he try Bud anything? Bud never all? tried it. The he little never one. Tried Forget anything, it. Huh? I see. <laughs> never. He never tried. <laughs> never did. But my brother George and I had talent. Right. But I must say this: uh, in later years, my father said he made a horrible mistake. He should have started me on drums because I had a better sense of time than my brother but George. Mm -hmm. And, and George, although he played adequately in the boys' band, he later dropped the drum, took up fiddle and violin. Is that right? <laughs> I mean, fiddle and guitar. Uh, now, uh, when you moved, did you say to Fort Worth? Yeah, Fort Worth. Uh, what was the atmosphere at that time in that area? Beautiful. And uh, what I remember about it was that my dad uh, was still playing a little bit. Uh, he moved to Fort Worth because he... Got a job with the United States Department of Agriculture in the marketing division or something. But he still liked to play a little, so I can remember in Fort Worth, Texas. I could have been over six or seven when he first moved down there. He, he, he was playing, I think, perhaps his last job. It was a dance, and he was playing dance drums. And uh, he took the whole family to the dance. And, <laughs> and I left. I was laughing about this with my brothers the last time I saw them. Here was four little kids just dancing. The old man's trying to play a dance job. And I remember my brother and I was out there. You know how they sprinkle stuff on the yeah. dance floor? <laughs> We're out there skating on it, you know. My <laughs> mother was out there grabbing us and bringing us back. And probably <laughs> the old man was up there trying to play and thinking, geez, what a thing. <laughs> I think that's the last job my dad played was. And I, and I remember very well. It was for the uh, Big Dandy Bakery. It was a bread company. It was a company dancer. Right. What kind of music were you playing? Just the music oh, of the day? They were just playing the dance music. I remember just uh, rhythm stuff. Not not uh, you Western. Hadn't, you just, hadn't really come in contact yet with any kind of what you'd call folk or no, uh, Western or country no, music. No, and uh, not yet, but soon. Mm -hmm. uh, the first country music I remember was uh, when I used to go down to my... Uh, in the meantime, my mother's father and mother had retired to a farm. He was a doctor, you remember. Retired to uh, a farm south of Fort Worth. And uh, 
I can remember going down to the farm in the summer, a beginning, beginning to hear the local uh, folk there. I remember one night there was a banjo player came over to our, our house uh, all alone and was playing banjo on our front porch and, and singing. That's the first country music as such that I can remember. About how, oh, how old have you been? Oh, uh, not over nine or ten. So right at this time, uh, there really wouldn't have been much what you would call commercial country or western music even in, in Cowtown at this time. No, not even in Fort Worth, Cowtown. I think uh, <clears throat> I was only about uh, nine or ten years old. Perhaps it was going on and I hadn't caught it yet because uh, uh, records and radio was just beginning then. And, uh, being a young boy, I, I suppose it's going on then. I didn't hear it, but but I I, I, I still seem to have a vague idea that uh, on records or uh, or somewhere I was beginning to hear uh, some country music. Uh, oh. Like I mentioned earlier, there was a, a name I shouldn't even probably try to think of. It seemed to me like it was Gilliam or Gillum was a was a guitar player who was making records then, but. Uh, I can't extend on it, so I better skip it. Uh, then how long did uh, the family remain in Fort Worth? Uh, in 1924, my father got transferred to Kansas City, Missouri. So uh, uh, we moved to Kansas City in, uh, I think it was the summer of uh, 1924. I remember on the way up, I remember hearing about uh, the death of uh, the President Warren Harding then in Seattle. And I said, well, who's going to be president, Mom? And she said, well, Calvin Coolidge. And I says, who's he? <laughs> I said, well, he's the vice president, and he becomes president. Uh, when you got into the Kansas City air, uh, area, uh, did you have any uh, different exposure to music? In other words, was it still you were uh, exposed to more or less the music of the day? Very much uh, a new exposure. Uh, not in our own work, because my father immediately... Enrolled my brother George and myself in the Kansas City Rotary Club Boys Band. <laughs> yeah. And we were doing band work. But, uh, now this is 24, and uh, at this time I was suddenly, suddenly thrown into, uh, uh, well, we call that a Yankee Town, boy. That was north, and it was cold in the winter. It was the first snow I ever saw, uh, that first winter. Uh but all of a sudden, uh, here was Kansas City, uh, the age of the early jazz band. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm talking about Benny Moten. Right. And uh, we began to hear some music that, uh, that startled me because it was early jazz, mm -hmm. colored bands, right. beautiful. And uh, You were impressed with that, weren't you? Oh, yes. It was something entirely new and... Uh, and I thought, what's what's going on? Mm -hmm. But now, at the same time, now I can remember some, uh, uh, if it wasn't the first year, it must have been a year or two later that uh, the famous Jimmy Rogers uh, records become getting popular. Wasn't Jimmy coming on about this time? I would guess uh, 25, 26, uh -huh. along in there. And I then think, I can uh, remember... Uh, Jimmy Rogers, I'm sure, I, he was the godfather of the Western music. And uh, I can remember hearing guitar. And then, uh, but this time, see, my sister was uh, four years older than I. She was about uh, 14 or so, and she was bringing records home. I can remember, that's the first time I can remember uh, records in our house. Yeah. And um, I can remember that she brought home Hawaiian records, mm -hmm. you know, Hawaiian music with the uh, old-fashioned lap. Steel guitar, dobro unamplified, guitar. yeah, that's the old dobro, <laughs> and uh, and and some uh, guitar music, yeah, it's Western tunes. Uh, do you recall uh, hearing any country or Western bands in this? Uh, in I don't area? think at that time there was any Western bands as such. Uh, well, you know the name country and Western is so interchangeable. I guess yeah. in that area, but I think in those it, days there were solos, guitar players, and yes. singers. I, I, in, in other words, uh, 
Well, even Jimmy Rogers, he worked alone, didn't he? Just guitar and vocal? Yes, I think so, because he had some big bands. As I recall, I'm no expert on Jimmy Rogers, but I think he had some big band sounds, and uh, uh, he, I think he mainly is known for his just his guitar and his, his single, but I yeah. think he did do some recordings with uh, big band sound. I, I have to uh, check on that, but I think I'm he did. I'm not sure about mainly that. It was, uh, uh, and then some of the early artists I can remember that were... Uh, semi-western, semi-folk, I don't know what you'd call it, uh, uh, Frankie Marvin, uh, Gene Austin, I'm talking 25, 26, they were the popular singers on record, and, uh, uh, Frankie Marvin, I forget what he had for cotton, I think it was guitar, he was a pop singer, and, and uh, Gene Austin, gee, making his biggest hits in uh, My Blue Heaven. Forgive me, My Blue Heaven. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I guess uh, this was the big, the ending of, I guess, along there, the, I guess, the, so the ending of the jazz uh, era, two to a degree. Of that era, yeah, yeah. The, what they call the 20s jazz, yeah. yeah. And uh, I don't know, in Kansas City, uh, I don't know whether you would have had uh, an awful lot of country music being played. I just don't know about in that particular I think area. you're right. Uh, this was know. a big city to us then, yeah. and, uh, and uh, we didn't think of it as country, you know. No. And we were hearing uh, city city music then. Right. So actually, uh, although uh, Western music might have been going on then, uh, we are kind of out of it being in a so-called, quote, big city, unquote. Right. right. So... Where was uh, where was your next move as far as uh, as a either as a job or a career? What what were you going to? Well, get into? I'll see. I was uh, I was going to school, of course, junior high school and high school, and uh, I think by about twenty six or seven, my brother and I dropped out of the boys band, and then I didn't play for a couple of years. So I'd have to take it up again about uh, 1928 when I got ill with uh, pleurisy and my mother sent me back to Oklahoma to stay with my grandmother in uh, Chickasha to finish my last two years of high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to admit that right then I uh, I don't remember any country music mm -hmm. because I started playing uh, in a high school dance orchestra. Is well, but this time I've taken up trumpet. I see. And uh, then I had a whole new world open up to me. Uh, I was interested in uh, dance music and uh, not country music. Nope. Not country music right. at all. The hits of the day then, like uh, Dream Train, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Now, was this in Chickasha? Yeah, in Chickasha. I finished my last two years of high school in Chickasha in 28 and 29. I graduated in June of 1930. Chickasha High School, raw, raw, raw. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, this is, I guess, is a strange uh, thing, too, as you reflect back on it. Uh, country music, I guess, really started in the country and worked its way into the big cities. And But here we see... A uh, small, and I would say Chickasha is a very small country town, but really they had no particular, or there was no predominance of country music being played in a small city. And not as far as I was concerned, because being a high school kid and uh, eager to learn the new uh, jazz music, but I, there must have been, uh, Maybe it, was uh, going on uh, it must have been going on then, right. and I wasn't conscious of it. Right. But this time I'm sure that Jimmy Rogers was, oh yes, in 28, he he was real famous yes, for them. I would think that. And I, I can right. remember hearing them. Here, I can remember hearing them. I, can, I think some of the, I think the first Jimmy Rogers tune I can remember was the Freight Train Blues. Or, yes, I met one of these here, famous yeah. old babies. He just, well, mainly his train songs. Yeah, know, so train that. sounds. And, right. and I liked it. Did you? But I thought it was a separate form of music, you know. Right. I could appreciate it, yeah. but it was... It was starting to come then. Right. But I guess uh, with your training, your background, there was no particular reason why you would take an interest I in didn't it. have training in, in Western music. You That's know, right. uh, as I say, uh, boys, I remember then all, all you heard in Western music was a guitar. Right. 
Well, and harmonica. Yeah, right. I guess that? yes, right. And I guess it's because of your father mm-hmm. leading you down the, the road to a sort of a professional. Yeah, he, he almost steered us into legit music. You know, we learned to read, and uh, and I just wasn't drawn into the country. Uh, these country boys were just coming off the farms. You know, they pick up a. Uh, you could buy what Sears and Roebuck right. guitar then for six dollars. Oh, I about right. And learn uh, three chords, F, C seventh, and right. B flat, right. and they were gone. Right. Like they used to say, uh, just show me where that F chord is. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're on your way. I was thinking in terms of uh, the contrast. Now Hugh Farr, I guess, one of the greatest natural fiddlers in the world, is with Sons Pioneers for a number of years. And, of course, his father was a sort of a country fiddler, and his natural led Hugh following his footsteps yeah. playing country music. I know he started out playing the guitar at about the age of six, the second thing for his dad. Then overnight he learned to play the fiddle, and he took up the fiddle, and his dad played the guitar <laughs> because he had oh, uh, his father. I knew the Far Brothers. I, I met them. Where are they from, by the way? I don't have to ask uh, you a question. Texas. They're from Texas. They're in yeah. Texas, mm-hmm. I think, since so, i Texas. And they, uh, they of course, were real professionals. Uh, Carl set the real trend for a number of years on the guitar. I would say so. Him. I would say so. And Hugh is uh, noted for being one of the and, greatest uh, national fiddlers. Yeah, he, could, he was a good player. Yeah. But to get back to your story now, uh, around 1930, now you have uh, completed your uh, your high school and uh, you're going out into the world. Uh, yeah, I went back to Kansas City for the summer with my folks, and then I enrolled in... Uh, University of Oklahoma in the fall of 31. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, but this time, uh, I was strictly, uh, non country music. Uh, right. I, I just forgot it or didn't hear it or something because I know I tried to get into the Oklahoma, you know, uh, some of the dance bands and at the university to help them pay my way through school, but I wasn't good enough, didn't make it. Mm-hmm. But you were just strictly with the trumpet at that time, then. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, yeah. I uh, the only thing I I played in the uh, university uh, Oklahoma band, marching band, you know, the school right. band. Uh, now, were there a great many good musicians in in the University of Oklahoma at that time? Oh words? yes, yes, sure were. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had three uh, dance bands. Mm-hmm. University and they're all three good and boy and I wanted to get in one of them. I just wasn't good enough. That's amazing to see the number of kids playing instruments in those days. Isn't mm-hmm. it? Yeah, well, not like today, of course. Gee, I think the University of Oklahoma band then had, I'm just guessing, maybe 80 people, 80, which was considered a huge band. But look at them now. I saw a band the other day of 200 men on the Yeah, table. right. But the the uh, again the dance bands you're talking about again they were just playing the uh, the pop music of the day. Yeah, mm-hmm. the hits of the day, and then the big hero then was Louis Armstrong. He was making the big big uh, jazz records. But they uh, they was good dance bands. God, they had uh, well that was what well, they called a big band in those days. Probably ten or eleven men, mm-hmm. three saxes. Three brass and four rhythm, <clears throat> but boy, that was my world then. But this time, uh, boy, I just want to play that. You had you decided this time that you perhaps would uh, would pursue a musical uh, profession? Uh, yeah, of course. This is a depression, and uh, and uh, I thought I was well. I I was trying to be a journalist, and I went to school two years, and uh, and. Uh, Trying to go to school on twenty five dollars a month, and did for two years, but then uh, I had to drop out. I just didn't have the money to finish. Right. Uh, but then uh, there was not. Then I did try to go into music for a living because uh, there was no other way to go. Mm-hmm. Well, how did you do that? What did well, uh, we uh, folks moved to West Texas in thirty three. Yeah, thirty three, thirty four. And uh, I remember I got a couple of friends of mine to move out to West Texas. It was near Lubbock, a mm-hmm. little town called Littlefield. And I worked with some bands out of Lubbock, just uh, jobbing. But uh, I'm getting way off the subject with you because uh, this Western music was uh, was 
not only on my mind then. Well, that's right. Sorry, listen. we're not getting what just all hard music, music, right? We're, we're getting uh, the Danny Yalgar story, yeah. and it yeah. includes all of your uh, uh, various. Uh, so I worked stuff. worked out in West Texas with bands out of Lubbock and uh, unknown bands, no names of any significance. Now, was that were you, were you going from city to city? Uh, no, we'd work, uh, just drive down or drive back. We'd right. play the surrounding towns like Tahoka. And mm-hmm. Now, what were you, were you still playing the music of the day? Yeah, I was playing the hits of the yeah. day, yeah. We now, had, what kind of crowd would you get at a turnout? Well, <laughs> sometimes it's pretty sad. Yeah. But, boy, this is, the, I'm talking about 33 and 34. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was tough times yes, in Ken, was, and right. uh, we might drive all the way down to Tahoka, which is the name that comes to my mind, south of Lubbock. Might be a fifty mile drive and uh and if we'd all divvy up and come out with four or five bucks a piece, well we thought we'd really had made made some money. <laughs> That's a familiar story from talking to the artists of those days, you know. Mm-hmm. So what uh, what did you do after you uh, in this after this period? Well, things were going kinda of tough there. Uh, my dad in the meantime had left the Department of Agriculture and he was a broom corn broker. You know what broom corn nope, is? I don't. It's what to make brooms out of. I see. Uh, it's it's a crop they grow. Uh, uh, probably one of the leading centers of broom corn growing is in Lindsay, Oklahoma, mm-hmm. in the Washita Valley. It's it's a funny thing. Uh, I won't dwell on this long, but yeah, it's the average guy what brooms are made of. They don't know. Mm-hmm. It's made out of broom corn. It's a sorghum. It looks like field corn growing, but there's a tassel grows out of the top that they make make brooms out of. So my dad was a broom corn broker in West Texas and was trying to promote the growth of broom corn out there because he thought the land was good for it. And, but uh, then we hit the droughts. You remember the oh, dust storms? And, yeah. and, uh, this would have been about and Things were tough. And, uh, so finally I said, I'm not getting anywhere and I'm a burden on the family. <laughs> so in, in January 1936, I left. Lubbock on a stock car pass on a freight car and came to California with my horn and a suit of clothes and 35 cents in my pocket. Is that right? Where did you land? I landed in Los Angeles. So you would have landed here in 1936. 1936, this was one that was no smog. Yeah, I agree. And I that. never saw more. Beautiful day in my life. And uh, I had a couple of friends here that I looked up to stay with for a while until I got going. Mm-hmm. And uh, you had decided at the time, though, you were going to pursue a musical career if you could. Had to. Mm-hmm. It, was, uh, it was still tough times, Ken. Right. And uh, so I figured my best bet was to go music the two friends that I ran into. And, and yet, I still wasn't involved in Western music yet. Uh, they, but this time, uh, I knew it was around. There was plenty of Western music, uh, country music around then, but uh, I still wasn't involved in it. I see. So you uh, stayed up here until about 1940. 1940, and then came back to L.A. Mm-hmm. The job played out up there. Came back here, and then I was, went back working joints again uh, for about a year. Then... In uh, October of 1941 was when I started getting into the Western music field as follows. I was working this job here in L.A. over on San Fernando Road and decided I would go back and visit my folks who were now living in Oklahoma City. So I got a substitute to take my place while I was gone. I only planned to be gone about two weeks. I went back to Oklahoma City. Now, in the meantime, I had heard that my good friend Benny Strickler, who I mentioned a moment ago, who was a a jazz trumpet player, not Western, had joined Bob Wills when he was out here in the summer of 41 making a picture. I don't think, did we ever pick up Benny prior to this, how you, where he came from, where you first met him? Somewhere? Benny was from Fayetteville, Arkansas, and uh, he he was associated with uh, strictly jazz music. Where did you first meet him? 
Uh, shortly after I come out here in 36 or 37. Well, then you had not known him back there. No, no, I didn't know Benny. Met him out here. But I'd heard that he had joined Bob Will's band. And the story goes that uh, he had heard Bob Bob Will's uh, record release of Big Beaver. And that was when Bob had started to use a few horns. Oh, yeah. The so-called early big band of Bob's. Right. And it was a hell of a record. Yes, it was. <laughs> it had a beautiful beat. Yes, it did. And so Benny heard Disney, and he wasn't doing too well out here. He had a wife and two little girls. What can you tell us before we go on with the Bob Wood story? What can you tell us about uh, Benny Strickler as far as what he may have been doing out here with the band? Well, is this, uh, do you know any history he, on Benny? Yes, he had worked with some pretty good named bands. In fact, he had auditioned with Artie Shaw. Uh, we didn't get the job because he didn't like Artie Shaw's style, which is hard to believe, but Benny was a very honest guy. He wanted to play what he wanted to play, but he worked with Wayne Minot's band and uh, Joe Venuti's band, and then a lot of just so-called uh, society bands that worked steady for a living, but didn't have big names. But he's a beautiful musician. You consider him a top notch I consider him one of my favorite all-time trumpet players. And so, as I say, when I heard that uh, he had joined Bob, uh, I thought, well, now, why would this guy join a Western band? And I have to hasten to add that uh, having been kind of out of touch with country music and Western music, uh, I hadn't realized how far it had progressed. I still thought of it as uh, a hillbilly, you know, or... Or banjos and guitars and harmonicas and uh, and uh, yeah and the uh, uh, country band, you know. Did Benny ever indicate how he got attracted to Bob's band? Yeah, he as I said, he heard this record of theirs yeah, that had okay. trumpets on it and everything, right. and and it was Big Beaver was right. the name of the tune, and and he later told me, said I heard this tune on a jukebox, and he said, this is a western band. I mean, what's going on? And uh, but it was honest. The music was honest, and, and Benny was honest. He wanted to play real honest, no kidding around. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd been back in Oklahoma City a couple of days, and I picked up a local newspaper, probably the Daily Oklahoman, and saw where it was on a Tuesday night that Bob Wills and his band was playing locally at the Trianon Ballroom right down Town. Now, this would have been 1940? 41. 41. I think November 41. Right, and Benny had been with him? And had been with him about three months. Three months. They had joined him out here this summer in L.A. And he, the story goes that Benny uh, uh, met Bob in the lobby of the Hollywood Plaza Hotel where he knew they were staying. I walked up to him and said, uh, my name is Benny Strickler. I'm from Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I want to play with your band. Is that right? <laughs> and Bob says, uh, looked at him a minute, says, uh, okay, you're hired. Is that and right? someone later asked Bob, says, well, how come you hired a guy you didn't even hear? And he says, and Bob said, well, I could tell by looking at him that he could play. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> that could be true. Yeah. Uh, Bob was a great judge of character, believe me. Uh, uh, boy, he was... Uh, so you're at the on and did you go down to... Uh... I said I had to go down that night and see what in the world uh, Benny was doing playing with uh, this Western band. So I went down and parked my car, I'll never forget. And I went up to the... It was an upstairs place, and it was just a upstairs a stairway going up to the ballroom upstairs. And it took me 15 minutes to get upstairs. I never saw such a crowd in my life. And I said, what in the world's going on? And even when I got upstairs, it took me another 10 or 15 minutes to work my way over to the bandstand. And I, there must have been 2,500 people there, Ken. And I said, this... In the meantime, I was hearing this music. And I could hear Benny and the, the whole band. Finally worked my way around to the side of the bandstand. And here was this band, and they had... Uh, it was the start of Bob, or the continuation of it. He had started using horns by then. Oh, yes, he had. And, uh, 
because this was, yeah, November 41. Well, he had, had a fairly big band sound in as early as about 1938. Uh, you know, he That's had right, Sykes, way back then. He had Wayne Johnson, Tubby, and Wayne Johnson and Tubby, Lewis. Tubby Lewis and, uh, and um, guys who, like that. Who do you recall being in the band at that, that time, that night? That night, and I can tell exactly who was in the band. It was Don Harlan playing first sax, Wayne Johnson was playing tenor, and then uh, for the first time that night, they, there was a guy sitting in called Woody Woods on third sax, and Louis Tierney, who was, had been playing fiddle with Bob, was playing sax. baritone sax. I had four saxes. Then for the first time that night, this was a coincidence, uh... Alex Bashir was sitting in on second trumpet his first night. Of course, Benny had been with the band playing first trumpet for two or three months. And uh, then they had the regulars. Uh, Liam McAuliffe was playing steel. Eldon Shamlin was playing standard guitar. Tommy Duncan was singing. Uh, Al Strickler. Strickland. Strickland, right. wasn't it? Right. Always getting mixed up yeah. with Benny. Right. Al Strickland was playing piano. Daryl Jones was playing bass fiddle, and uh, Gene Tomlin was playing drums. I think that comprises, the, oh, and then uh, Bob was playing fiddle, of course, Louis Tierney was Dublin fiddle. Uh, did That's he, all the fiddles did I had. He, did he didn't have Jesse with him at that time. Jesse who? Jesse Ashlock. No, Jesse had left Joe, the band by then. Uh, Joe Holly wasn't with him. Joe at the was time. playing with his brother uh, Johnny Lee Wilson. I see. No, the only fiddles was Bob and uh, Bob and Lurie played twin fiddles the first night there. So, uh, the reason I got in the band, uh, Benny. Well, had, before we progress there, like, give me your impressions of that night of. Uh, the music that they were playing and what your immediate reaction was to this Gladly. Uh, my first impression was that how good the man sounded. Mm -hmm. It had a beat, Ken, that wouldn't quit. I was amazed at the beat of the band. It was uh, good, strong, and honest. And uh, It's one of those kind of beats where uh, uh, they say if you can't dance to that beat, you can't walk, you know. Right. <laughs> Strong beat, God, uh, beautiful bass player, Daryl Jones. Well, the whole band was just uh, yeah. just playing great. Did you mention drummer? Yeah, Gene Tomlin. Gene Tomlin, mm -hmm. right, okay. Then, uh, so I caught Benny's eye, and uh, he looked down, and the last time he'd seen me was in California. He said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm just visiting here, and the band sounds great. I'm enjoying it. He says, you got your horn? I says, yes, down the car. And he says, go get it, because Bob wants to add another trumpet there. <laughs> <laughs> so I went down, got my horn, and sat in with the band, played the whole the rest of the night, and when we got through, uh, I hadn't even met Bob, I just sat in and and took some courses and played, you know, mm -hmm. they had music and everything, and fake, and and at the end of the job, Benny took me down to meet Bob, he says, uh, this is Danny Algar, a friend of mine from California, it's uh, uh, been sitting in, and uh and Bob says, how do you do? You want to work in my band? <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> and I got hired that night. Uh, now, was this an unusual occurrence for a musician to sit in with the band? It was very unusual that Bob hired three new men that one night. This uh, Woody Woods and Alex and myself. I see. Hired. He wanted to, he was just starting to build up. He decided that he wanted to go the full route, you know, and get a big band so that he could play any kind of a job. Let's run down the list of people that you have uh, mentioned uh, there, uh, Danny, and uh, give me your impressions as far as the abilities of each one of them. Well, uh, my first impression was the overall sound of the band, of course, which uh, stunned me. Uh, two things stunned me that night. The first thing was the immensity of the crowd. There had to be 2,500 people there. Uh, you look out there, and there was a sea of faces uh, or bodies uh, dancing, and I hadn't seen anything like that in my life. You know, this was uh, uh, something that I couldn't believe. I thought, this guy is, must have a magic touch to draw 
on a Tuesday night, uh, this many people. But that was only a start. Later on, I was to be more amazed than that by crowds. But uh, that's the first big thing of something else. Like, huh, this, this guy must have something to draw this many people. And then, of course, the sound of the band uh, was quite impressive, as I say. They, it was a swinging beat, and uh, and it was good. Of course, right away I could see that uh, that the horn, the band was divided with the horns and uh, and the regular Western setup. And right away I could hear the beautiful ability of Leon McAuliffe. You know, there's none better ever since than Leon McAuliffe on steel guitar. And uh, Ellen Shaman amazed me on standard guitar because uh, I thought, well, I, I didn't know Western guitar players played this good. Of course, he and uh, and um, Leon had so many guitar duets worked up, and and I was quite impressed that night with the work, with how they worked together and back and forth and and between them. And then, of course, this Daryl Jones on uh, bass. Uh, See right away, and this Gene Tomlin. Well, I, I was, you know, as you sit there and start to play, you start your ear starts to pick up on all these guys, and I thought, well, gee, what a beautiful bunch of musicians that play so well together. Well, uh, all I could tell right away uh, was uh, uh, the sax section as a whole just blended beautifully. Got it? Sound like Glenn Miller's the one. <laughs> Uh, but, of course, it was later that I began to know them individually. But uh, as an overall sound, I thought, gee, what a nice sax section. But, uh, and then, oh, Alex Bashir on sec second trumpet was playing courses. You know, later on, he became uh, chief arranger in the band and arranged all these good horn tunes. And how would you rate the now you with the sax men? How would you rate them as abilities and other words as far as what they could and do, or could not do as far as the quality musicians? Well, uh, my first impression was they sounded like a professional group. I mean, I I, I couldn't believe this. They was working in a Western band, and yet uh, here these people are out there buying anything that Bob put out. You see, the secret. I got to say this now: the secret of Bob Will's band was Bob Wills. And when you projected and played, you didn't play to the people. You played to Bob, and Bob sold you. Mm -hmm. Bob had a way of yelling and urging you on. Right. And and the people of Bob Wills, and anything that he told them that was good, they'd believe it. But Bob had a, I, I don't get the wrong impression, the guys played good. But Bob had a way, like, you kind of played to Bob. You kept one eye on Bob when you played because he wanted to be a part of your plan. It was a strange thing. Maybe I'm not explaining it good. But I know when I used to go up to a microphone or any of the singers and sang on the mic, you kind of half-faced the audience and half-faced Bob so that Bob, you know, Bob liked to yell in between or give you a, or holler your name or something. But you kind of caught on. I don't know where I got the trick early, but uh, I soon caught on that that you didn't just stand in front of the mic and face out towards the audience, that you kind of three-quartered face the audience and one-fourth face Bob, because Bob had a way of he wanted to stand there with you and and holler between or something. That was his way of selling, but, but he... Even if he was a lousy singer, he'd make you look good because he had a way of project, projecting you or selling you to the people. Uh, Don Harlan is the name that sticks in my mind. Was Don the, uh, a quality musician as far as sex band? Uh, Don was one of those other guys that uh, started out as a legitimate musician around Tulsa. He, I think he's originally from Joplin, Missouri because I later ran into a friend that knew him and played with Don years ago, but he wound up in Tulsa and uh, got with Bob somewhere. He was a good, what do we call a good legitimate musician. He was a good, strong first man. He didn't take too many solos, but he, uh, what they call, led the section. Mm -hmm. And you see, uh, you had Louis turning out. Louis was... Louis started out as a fiddle yeah. player and then learned to play sax. He was 
is not what you'd call a real strong sax man. Uh, no, uh, he he could read, and he played a fourth part, which yeah. is is the the least uh, hardest part in the sax section. But Louis Louis's a country boy, mm -hmm. and so who essentially else? played fiddle. Yeah, who else was in the sax now? Sorry, I don't recall. Well, as I say, the the new boy they hired that night was Woody Woods. Now Woody was strictly a jazz boy. And his forte was he played beautiful clarinet. He could play as good as Benny Goodman or Artie Shaw. And he played with such name bands as uh, Red Nichols and uh, Henry Halstead and and some of the uh, better dance bands of the day. And the reason he joined the band, I later learned, because he heard the band, he liked Benny Strictor's playing, and... and uh, Need the job and uh, was glad to play in the plan. Uh, now, He's an Oklahoma boy. Right, now, besides yourself and uh, and uh, Benny, who else was there? Was there another trumpet? Well, there was person? Alex Bashir on the second Bashir's trumpet. Right. I was playing third right. part. Was uh, Alex? Uh, Alex had had a good background. He had uh, there too. He again uh, had never played much with Western bands. I think he said he played some with Merle Lindsay. Remember Merle Lindsay? Oh yes. Uh, but then he kind of, of course, uh, there again, you know, a, a musician will work where he made a living, you know. But he had worked with Merle Lindsay's Western Band and uh, Henry Halstead and some of the bands. He'd kind of gone back and forth, but he, he was essentially uh, not a Western musician as such. Uh, do you have any recollections of uh, Al Strickland on the piano? Yeah, uh, now he was a... Uh, he was not. I could see immediately that he was a, a Western piano player. He had that, uh, what we call a Texas style of piano playing. I learned to identify that as Texas style later. Uh, Millard Kelso had it too. It's kind of a wild <laughs> piano style. Uh, it was very interesting, and it's uh, loud, rambunctious, and uh, spirited. That's the first uh, recollection I have of Bob Wills Band was in Oklahoma City about 1936, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I remember seeing Alan. I was impressed the way he'd throw his hands when he played. Yeah, you know, wild like, abandon. Yeah, right? <laughs> and he didn't particularly pay attention. And he wasn't, uh, you'd have to say that Al was not well schooled in, uh, in music uh, uh, legitimately. And uh, Al even played some wrong chords and everything, but... Uh, you know, the strange thing about it, uh, I I understand he he was hired out of some university in Texas where he taught music. Isn't that strange? Gee, you got me there. I don't yeah. know. He supposedly had a real background in piano. Oh, well, now he might have. You know, he might have. All I know he had that, a style of his own. that he played a, a, a real spirited style of piano that... Uh, I know when Bob says, get it, Al, yeah. Al got it. <laughs> uh, let's see, now we've covered the saxes and the and the trumpets. Uh, and let's see, what else would we have there? Well, of course, uh, Leon McAuliffe was just yes, beautiful on right. steel, and Ellen Chamlin was, they were great. was a marvelous uh, standard guitar player. Now, let's see, there's, um, uh, of course, Tommy Duncan. Tommy Duncan was a singer. What was your impressions of Tommy? Well, I thought he was just a good country singer. Yeah. Uh, well, this time, of course, they had had uh, San Antonio Rose, you know. Oh, yes. It was big but then, and they were sailing. Right. Did you uh, did you particularly enjoy Tommy's style of singing? In other words, was it your type of singing? Uh, it wasn't my type. I mean, I didn't sing. Oh, yeah. Uh, let me take that back. <laughs> uh I knew he was a good Western singer. I didn't think I sang like him, but uh, but after uh, Tom went the, uh, had to go in the Army and I had to take over singing San Antonio Rose and some of Tom's tunes, uh, a lot of people said I sounded like him. <laughs> well, I thought Tommy in his day had a real fine voice because, you know, he came, I think he had a little yearly Jimmy Rogers influence some of his early singing and so forth, you know. But... Um, what about the personalities of the individuals there? Is there any particular personalities in the band that you enjoyed? Well, my first uh, 
enjoyment of the whole group was uh, what a wonderful bunch of guys the whole the whole band was my god uh, I loved them they were all real honest down to earth people and uh, but after being out here in California and fighting these nightclubs and cold, stiff people, well, I was uh, being an Oklahoma boy at heart and, and friendly by nature. Uh, I was just, there was the happy of my life is to get with a bunch like that that uh, fought and played together. And uh, The spirit of the people. The spirit they, of the yeah. band was beautiful. Right, and they got along fairly well. And oh, individual. beautiful, no yeah. hassle. No, no. no problem. Uh, what... Uh, 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 stands out in your mind as far as the type of uh, song that was really uh, being requested the most other than San Antonio Rose. Do you recall any other songs that was really high on the... Oh, well, we played record? everything. Uh, uh, one thing I early began to love was uh, some of Bob's own tunes, that, you know... Uh, Tunes that the, the band had already recorded that were people were asking for, like uh, um, oh, uh, maiden's prayer. Oh God, yes, maiden's prayer was a standard. And Tommy's uh, uh, time changes. Time changes everything, everything and I uh, began to learn that these were tunes that either Bob or Tommy or the two of them or some of the guys in the band, of course, and steel guitar rag, of course, yeah. and uh, but. Uh, Spanish two-step. Oh, yeah, Spanish two-step, and uh, God is one that I always loved. Oh, the world may have its trials and tribulations. You know, tunes like that. that were the just moment the, I lost you. The moment I lost you, and uh, God learned to begin to, as I said earlier in our talk here, uh, I began to appreciate these nice tunes. Mm -hmm. They had good, uh, sincere meaning behind them. Like uh, the moment I lost you, I was quite impressed with this too. Yeah. And uh, these tunes that Bob wrote, like My Confession, and and, uh, and then he used to do uh, a lot of tunes that I'd never heard before that were, or tunes that he liked that he picked up from other people like uh, Bob, uh, one of Bob's earlier wives was named Mary, uh, maybe his first wife. He used to sing, loved to sing My Mary, which was written by uh, uh, Stuart Hammond. Stuart Hammond, right. Mm -hmm. Bob never was what you call a top-notch singer, you know, but I guess he had a... I'll tell you, Bob, uh, for what he lacked in, say, God-given voice or something, Bob made up in pure sincerity and heart when Bob sang a tune. He put everything he had into it, Is that right? and he meant it. And I don't care if he jumped a meter or, two or skipped a bar or anything. He could sing a tune, and the people did like it because he meant it. He wasn't kidding. It came from his heart. Uh, where did you, uh, now you joined them, this would have been in Oklahoma City in 1941. Uh -huh. About November. Then where would you have progressed with the band from there? Where the hell? Yeah, where was the band? Was it based in? It was uh, based in Tulsa. Tulsa. Yeah, they uh, the schedule then I can almost uh, remember as if it were yesterday. Every Tuesday night we played the Tree and Our Ballroom in Oklahoma City. On Thursdays and Saturdays we played Kane's Academy in Tulsa. One Friday night we played Seminole, Oklahoma. The alternate Friday we always played Fort Smith, Arkansas. Then on the Wednesdays and Mondays that were left over, we would alternate between towns like Enid, uh, McAllister, uh, maybe run up to Hudson, Kansas. So those were the kind of the free nights, the Mondays and Wednesdays, that we'd shoot around catching uh, some of the smaller towns or something. And we were off on Sunday. But every noon, no matter where we were during the week, we got back in at Tulsa at night anywhere between 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock in the morning. We were at Kane's Academy at high noon to play from 12 to 12.30 for the Playboy Flower half-hour broadcast, which covered the whole state of Oklahoma and parts of Texas, no doubt. Uh, this was uh, probably, uh, I guess, about the hype 
point of the Bob Wills Band in 19, I guess, 40 and 41. So that's sort of the peak of the Bob Wills era as far as the band is concerned. I'd say the peak was in the summer of 42 when we came to Los Angeles. And that's why I wanted to mention crowds. Uh, we came out to Los Angeles in the summer of 42. Oh, around July, yeah. Uh, to make some records. The big, that big band record session, of which you'll probably want to know about more later. But we played... I remember the 4th of July fell on a weekend. I don't know whether it was a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whether it was the 2nd, 3rd, or 4th, or what. It was a July 4th weekend. We played the old Venice Ballroom. And in those three nights, I think for the three nights, we played to somewhere between thirteen and 14,000 people. And that really that really got me. I said, this, this must do it, to come to California and pull a crowd like that. Can you just to go back? I want to come back to this. Could you go back? I know it's somewhat of an abstract question, but uh, just recount what a, a, a typical 12 to 12:30 broadcast would be like. In other words, you're going in and you're getting the band set up and so forth. And uh, what comments would pass as far as Bob and you and so forth? And how would you make your plans as what you're going to play and so forth? Well, every day, uh, I think Don Harlan. Made up the broadcast. It was his job to uh, to make up the broadcast. And let's see, in a half hour show, I would, we'd play between six and eight tunes. But we'd always mix them up. We'd uh, be a vocal, you know, instrumental, and uh, it was well balanced. And of course, uh, room enough in between for the the pitch. Uh, Oh, I gotta remember that announcer we had. He was something. Franklin. You recall that name? No, I what had happened. He's part of Bob Life's history. What happened this to guy, him uh, Stover though? Where, where had Ernie, he, uh Stover had left. Had left. Stover had left the band before I came in it. Uh he played trumpet, you know, and I think he used to do the announcing, didn't yes, he? Yes, very definitely, yes. A store left. Uh, I don't know why. I don't know whether he and Bob had a beef or uh, what happened. Uh, store left the band, and he had been in the band five or six years. Well, he was one of the uh, original members of the band. He and O. W. Mayo had he, come up from Moico with yeah. Bob. I, I, you know more about that than I do. Uh, I know that. Uh, he was a strong part of Bob's band for five or six years before. He left, and uh, yeah, so as I remember, he did the announcing. He was a sharp cookie, I heard, and a pretty good trumpet player. He was on the San Antonio Rose record. Now, uh, uh, O.W. Mayo was not there at that time either? Oh, yes. O.W. was... Uh, he was the business manager? was the business manager, very much so then. Now, who was this fellow you were trying to think of the name of that did the announcing? Franklin. And I can't think of his first name now, but he was a high winder from... Uh, he wasn't a native of Oklahoma, I'll tell you that. He was a he was one of these wandering guys uh, that was a, a hell of a talker, a hell of an announcer. He was he was what I'd call a pitch man. And how he got tied into Bob, I don't know. He was a, he was there when I joined the band. But man, he could sell Playboy Flyer, I'll guarantee you. Playboy Flyer. He was a fast talker, pitch man, and uh, and he'd come on that air boy like NBC. <laughs> right. Uh, strange character, but he could, uh, you know, there was a tie between some major uh, flower company and uh, and Bob, and they called it Playboy Flower, and man, I guess they sold tons of it. <laughs> Uh, Dan, you know, one of the uh, things that uh, stand out in my mind about the Bob Wills band was the two sounds that really emanated from the band. For instance, uh, as you recall, uh, at times on the record you could hear the big band sound like Big Beaver, then you get into a fiddle tune like uh, uh, old Spanish two-step, Miss, uh, Molly. Miss Molly, and so forth, and you get an entirely different sound. So could you, uh, can you recall exactly how Bob worked that? Well, uh, to begin with, I thought 
This is what Bob wanted to finally get. He wanted a versatile band. And uh, at the time, the night I joined him, along with Alex and uh, Woody, uh, and I'm just speculating now, but I think what he had in mind was that he was getting very popular, and he his idea was that uh, he wanted to play all kinds of music, that he wanted to play for the people, and he wanted a, a band that could go in any direction that that the people that he was playing for uh, dictated or wanted. And as I got into the band and began to observe, uh, my remembrance of it is that, that, that that's what Bob wanted. So it worked out like this, that it proved out. Say, for instance, uh, on, say, a Monday or Wednesday night, which I remarked earlier was somewhere off nights when we would just pick up different towns. <clears throat> say, for instance, on a Monday night, we'd play a small town like oh, Pahuska, say, for instance, which we did a few times. Well, I can remember Pahuska being a small town, um, like what, 8,000 or something, a truly small town. Well, these people, uh, Bob just had a sense of knowing, uh, would not buy too many horn tunes or the horn arrangements. And I can remember like uh, like a town like Pahuska would play, uh, he'd use the horns very sparingly, and he would play... Uh, guitar pieces and uh, fiddle tunes like the, the program would be made up of such tunes as, as the moment I lost you and uh, time changes everything and and a couple of square dances thrown in with uh, someone up uh, Tommy calling on the squares and steel guitar rag and tunes like that and the only times the horns were used much were like uh, just I give him a course occasionally, a solo horn course. Mm -hmm. Then, when Bob would play Kane's Academy or Oklahoma City, or like we'd take a two week trip down through Texas and play Fort Worth and, and Dallas and some of the bigger towns where the people were, oh, what would you call it, more sophisticated? A little more sophisticated. Uh, he'd throw them the horn tunes. And uh, but throw in enough fiddle tunes to to be Bob Wills. I mean, Bob, uh, I can't stress it enough. Had that was one of his greatest assets. He had that sixth sense of knowing what the people at that particular dance that night wanted to hear. And I never saw him call a wrong tune. He just seemed to know what to play and when to call a horn tune. I wanted to call a fiddle tune, I wanted to call a vocal, I wanted to call a guitar special. Uh, and listen, even today, uh, years later, I, uh, working in a firehouse five like I am now, I have taught the guys in the band the tricks of the Bob Wills era of how to call tunes for people. I learned them. Mid I used to watch Bob like a hawk, and 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 watch him call the right tune at the right time. And I figured out he had a system. Uh, he never called the same tempo or the same key twice in succession. In other words, the tempo would either be a faster or slower tune. He never played like two tunes in a row the same tempo. It would either be slower or faster. So that you had an undulating type of dance, which made for interesting music, you see. He'd play a slow tune, then it'd pick up, then go faster, then he'd drop down and play a waltz. You know, it, it was ever-changing. And that's one of the beautiful tricks I learned from Bob Wills. I don't know if he ever knew it, I learned that, but uh, he knew. And getting back to your original question, he just seemed to know when to call horn tunes and when to call fiddle tunes. And you're quite right, he had a tune sound band, and he used it very, very wisely. Uh, now, on the radio programs, did you also have, did he have that 
the uh, same general thing that on the on the uh, radio broadcast he would use the horns and he would throw in the fiddle. To yeah. Case mm-hmm. it, uh, on the uh, broadcast, uh, seemed to me he'd just mix them up evenly, play fiddle tune and play a horn tune and or a vocal uh, or a waltz or something. I remember every Thursday though was religious day. Every Thursday, uh, uh, just the key men would show up, and I used to go being a horn man, but I wouldn't play, because Thursday, Al Strickland always played the pump organ, and we did uh, gospel tunes. Is that right? Thursday was, and I used to go because I loved to sing them. (laughs) I wouldn't bring my horn, but you know, we'd be... Beautiful things like farther along and oh gee, beautiful. I guess Tommy could sing this. Uh, this oh, really Tom popular. was born and raised on church music. You know, but the strange thing, I don't recall that they ever recorded one religious tune. You know, you're right. But you're right. Think they ever and they could do them one. like crazy. You're, you're right. Uh, by gosh, you surprised me. Uh, I don't remember Bob ever recording it. But every Thursday at the noon broadcast, was uh, religious day, and we did nothing but church hymns and and gospel tunes. Yeah. And, and I, I used to yeah. love to go down there just because I like to sing gospel tunes and uh, all these things. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, always been a, a rather a disappointment to me that uh, that when it comes to recording, I hate to second guess Bob because I think he did so many things right, but. When I think about the tunes that he could have recorded that I think maybe they would not have been commercially acceptable, I don't know, but I've often wondered why Bob did not record more of the standards of the day, uh, the country standards of the day, and less of the some of the uh, flashy ones that he did put out. Well, you know, uh, I'm just speaking off the top of my head now, but... Uh, Bob usually recorded his own stuff, didn't he? Just a great deal, lad. And, of course, then he got with the Fred Rose bit and then with the Cindy Walker yeah, bit. Yeah, the, yeah. Then, well, uh, take our recording session of 1942, the only one I ever made with him, which was a two- or three-day thing. I, we must have made 16, 18 sides, maybe not that many. Uh as I remember, Bob didn't have much to do with calling what was played. We played some uh, Freddie Rose tunes, and and uh, some Cindy Walker tunes, and uh, and what did we do? Uh, you have a good knowledge of those tunes. I think the only uh, my confession was Bob's. I think on that session, uh, one of the better songs was uh, Ten Years. That's Johnny Bond's song. Uh, Johnny Bond wrote that? Right. I didn't know that. Yeah, and also uh, Dropped Me Off Down at Bob's Place. That was one that was never released. Dropped Me Off at Bob's Place. Yeah. That's one of that was a days. fiddle tune, wasn't it? Uh, no, I think Leon Huff did most of the singing on that session. There was no horns on it, though, no. Uh, no, I think it's me. It's what it could be a fiddle tune. Uh, it, uh, there's another Johnny Bond song, which didn't uh, go, and uh, You Don't Care What Happens to Me. Uh, I think that may... Is that a horn tune or a fiddle tune? No, I think it's a... Uh, you don't care you know, Was that a Leon Huff vocal? Yeah, I think so. Uh, it's strange. I uh, Tommy remember. Duncan that was in the army then. I remember. Yes. We picked up Leon Huff from from um, Texas. He just come out of that election. He had the the van down there trying to elect what Papio Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Leon's voice never did really turn me on too much. You know? No. Uh, actually, he didn't have a western voice. No, he didn't have a, a voice I like. But getting to voices. When did you first start singing with the band? The well, beginning? right right away, Bob uh, says, do you sing? And uh, I said, uh, well, yeah, kind of. So Bob began, uh, as we get new tunes in, uh, I'll tell you what category I fell into, Ken. Uh, uh, he had me singing uh, more of the hits of the day. I can remember, uh, like, Tommy wasn't quite fitted for certain tunes and he started shoving tunes to me like well the wartime tunes are coming on in I remember I used to sing uh, 
White Cliffs of Dover and Samsung and uh, uh, Chattanooga Choo Choo. Mm -hmm. He'd throw things like that to me because I was having come out of that vein of music, you know. Right. I, I, and uh, and the, there again, uh, Bob was the one that told me to sing them. I guess he figured I was... Well, I think it's very You know, he, right. Bob was good at uh, what you call typecasting. Right. Very he he figured me for certain right. tunes, and, and I do uh, tunes like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he, does that matter if he wouldn't give me any Western songs? <laughs> uh, now, as far as I, uh, I can recall, the Home in San Antonio was the only recording he made with Bob. Yeah, and I know why he picked me for that. We was out there making that session, and... Uh, and uh, they run the tune down, I remember, and uh, he says, Dan, I want you to sing this. And I said, all right. And uh, now why he didn't pick Leona for it instead of me, I don't know. Well, I'm, but, I, I'm grateful he did because you did a real fine job on this. Well, I was sure proud to be on it. And uh, I remember we uh, ran it down and uh, rehearsed it. And then uh, and I said, okay, let's make a take. And... Uh, so we, we made a take on it, and then then they played it back, and then right after they played it back, I went up to Bob, and there was one little part in there that I didn't think I did good on, and I says, well, I uh, missed that bottom note a little bit. I'd, I'd sure like to do it again. And Bob says, sounds good enough for me, Dan. What's the next tune? Sorry. <laughs> and we went ahead, and, and it was a one-take thing. And, Is that right? That's uh, a Fred Rose song. Hmm? That is a Fred Rose song. Well, uh, yeah, Fred Rose. Yeah, I remember that, you know, I suggested a change in the lyrics to Bob on that tune. Yeah. I was always one to speak up. Right. <laughs> Let's see, there was one. This might, you might find this interesting. There's, there's one line in there that said, uh, the original line says, uh, when I greet my neighbors with a howdy all was yeah. the original line. Oh, was that right? And I said, Bob, well, wouldn't that sound more natural if I said, uh, when I greet my neighbors with a, how you all? And he said, yeah, I would. So I didn't think, right. howdy all. It right. sounded a little stiff. Awkward. They're awkward, yes. So he said, yeah, he sang it that way. There's Bob yeah. for you, you know. He, no problem. Well, I, I I think uh, the the song itself was it was a uh, it's a good song. Uh, as I say, the name on there is Floyd Jenkins, but Floyd Jenkins was uh, well, Fred Rose, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, Fred that's Rose right. Eh? The plume. Probably uh, BMI problems or right, something. Then it seems to me there was a hassle then about. Right, so he used the name that he had to use whenever he. I think that was why there was a BMI strike or an ASCAP strike. Oh. It was an ASCAP strike, and all we could use was BMI tunes or something. Is that right? I know we had to watch what we played. Uh, you know, Dan, there's one record on that, and you know, it's terrible because like, I'm usually pretty good on Bob Wills things, but there's one song on there, and for the life of me, I can't think of it, but it's a real jazzy thing, Lord. And Bob starts off hollering right at the beginning of it. He, he just about goes out of his was mind. Was that the Ride with Bob? That's Ride with Bob. Well, we used that for our theme song, you yeah. know. Oh, he just liked to knock himself out hollering on that one. But do you recall recording that? Did I recall mm -hmm. one? Do you recall that particular one? Oh, yeah. Uh, Bob wanted a, a, oh, two or three months or maybe more before we come out to California in the summer of 42. Bob had the big band. And I forget, he was using some fiddle tune for a theme song. Well, he used to use... Uh, with the Texas Playboys. Yeah. Listen, everybody, if you want to know. Everyone over here, are the Texas Boys. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And But he had this horn band, and uh, uh, it wasn't suitable for horns. So he said one day, uh, this, at a rehearsal, I remember, Kansas County was just, let's come up with a, a nice big full horn thing for a theme song. And I, I think Benny Strickler, Benny Strickler says, well, let's just play, uh, base it on uh, uh, what they call the B-flat blues pattern, 12-bar blues. And he set this riff, da 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 And then we started kicking around, playing it there, and then it resolved 
and to the theme ride with Bob. I don't know who thought the title. But uh, one good feature of it, I remember the horns would go da 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 da. Then Leon McAuliffe on steel would go da 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 dee da 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 with a fill in. Is that right? You remember it? Well, I don't And so we, up we had it pretty well time. worked out. We'd used it uh, for a couple of months. Every time we started to dance, we started using this. And Bob loved it. Is that Because right? it was a keen tune for him to holler all. Oh, <laughs> man. On that you know, record. it was just slow blues. Dun, 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 blah, blah. He'd go, ah. Well, he already knocked himself out of that. But that and so he wanted to make it. He That was one tune that, uh, that he wanted to make called Ride with Bob. In the meantime, on we'd changed personnel. But this time we'd picked up, we'd dropped Gene Tomlin on drums. I picked up Bob Fitzgerald, who was a beautiful drummer. And uh, Wayne Johnson had dropped out of the band, and we had George Bailey mm-hmm. on tenor, and it was George Bailey that played that beautiful tenor solo on that record. I don't know whether you recall it or not. Woody Woods played a beautiful clarinet solo. Uh, they Alex Bashir played the solo on They indicated that Wayne Johnson came back for one of the final recording sessions on that day. Not, not in California. No, no. Uh, this particular was, one. Now, uh, in this California you, session, Wayne Johnson was not okay, on any of now, these. Can, uh, can you give, recall the exact names of the people that were there? Yes, the sir. Okay. The, it yeah. was the same band, except Tommy Duncan was gone and Leon Huff was in his place. Gene Tomlin was gone on drums, and Bob Fitzgerald had taken his place. George Bailey had taken Wayne Johnson's place on the saxophone. We had added a trombone player, Neil Dewar. Uh, well, he came to the band shortly after I did. But uh, otherwise, the personnel was the same, except we had Joe Holly on that session, along with Gene uh, Louis Tierney. Now, had we had an extra fiddle player. Had Joe just joined the band about this time? Uh, he, I think uh, Bob just brought him to California with us to, uh, because Louis playing sax, it was hard for him to get up and down. You know, Louis was crippled, yeah. and it wasn't easy for him to jump up and play fiddle right suddenly. So I think, as I remember, Bob just brought Joe along for an extra fiddle player. Well, I think Joe had joined the band in the 40s. He had been playing with Johnny Lee's band. Daddy, you know? I see. And uh, he and, uh, oh, Johnny had a rip-snorting band then that used to, at uh, the same time our band was going, Bob's band. Uh, Johnny used to play the smaller towns, you know. He had about the same schedule we did, uh, going out every night, except uh, they'd come back in and they had a morning broadcast. No matter where they played, they had to get back in at 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, uh, from one of those early morning Purina flower type things, you know, the, 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 the first thing on the air for the station in the morning. And uh, got us some funny stories, uh, like if they'd play close, like uh, Sand Springs or something close, of course they'd be back in early enough to go home and get a few hours of sleep. But sometimes they'd be like playing away over in Enid or with Tomka or something. They'd get back just about in time to make this broadcast, but they'd always make it. They had a five or six hour drive. And uh, oftentimes they'd get there and they'd just go to the station and grab anywhere from two to three hours sleep uh, before they went on. And they they, they tell a funny story about Junior Bernard was playing guitar with John Lee then. And here they'd done this night, day, morning in and morning out for years, you know. And, And they were used to some kind of coming over waking them up and say, okay, here we're on the air, you know. And they never made up any program. They just come on the air with their theme song for Purina um, Cow Chow or whatever it was this being sponsored by. So this one morning, they tell us a real funny story about the station was suddenly preempted by a special coast-to-coast show, so they, they were off the air. But they couldn't resist baiting poor Junior Bernard, the big fat boy. So they went over, woke him up, said, come on, Junior, we're on the air. And so George Junior gets up half asleep and gets his guitar, and they play the theme song. And, and as I say, they never made a program. Johnny Lee come up to Mike and says, well, uh, 
Why do you say we start the show off this morning and have Junior sing it to him? Come here, Junior. Come up to the mic. Junior wanders up yawning. Uh, we sleep it on. Johnny Lee says, uh, Well, what do you sing, Junior? And Junior was hemp on. He says, Well, I don't know. I'm just kind of stalling around. And Johnny Lee says, Well, speak up, you son of a bitch. What are you going to sing? <laughs> and then Junior's mouth flew open. <laughs> He couldn't talk. <laughs> These guys were great for uh, practical jokes. Oh, God. They, uh, they wouldn't give him a story. <laughs> <laughs> froze. He almost fainted. But on this recording session, uh, now, was Bob Lee on this recording session? Yes, yes. There was a little boy we had picked up. He'd been, uh, been with the band a couple of months or three. Uh, where he come from, I don't know. He showed up and... Uh, and Bob hired him. He had a pretty little voice. It wasn't Western. He just said, sang pretty. Right. And uh, and he was crippled. I forget what his problem was, whether he had polio or... He didn't walk with... He didn't need crutches or anything, but he walked with a decided limp. And and, uh, and I guess Bob just felt sorry for him. Although he, he did have a nice voice. It wasn't a Western voice. No. But you know, um, I've got to remark here that uh, I don't think Bob thought of himself as uh, particularly Western or, or or what he played, like uh, like when he formed a horn band. He didn't seem to bother him that it was Western or not Western. Uh, I must remark, uh, and I was admiring Bob for this. Because Bob Bob figured that whatever he had in the bandstand, he'd sell it, right. <laughs> you know. Right. And so he he just picked up this Bobby Lee, and he'd give Bobby. Uh, like I say, Bob was a great typecaster, so the type of tunes he'd give to Bobby were pretty things, right. like this "My Laddie You," listen, and uh, and uh, he sang ballads of pretty things, mm -hmm. which uh, might be western or they may not. But Bob had uh, sang along, so he brought him to California, too. Right. Did he play an instrument at that time? No. No, he was no. If he uh, did, I didn't know it. He never well, played in band. On that uh, recording session, then, the, it went on for about three days, is that right? I think so. I think right. it was a three-day session. Now, while you were out here, were you also playing at the local, like... Uh, the, yeah, we were playing, uh, uh, we were playing dances uh, somewhere every night. Like, I remember this big three-day thing we played at the Venice Ballroom, and... Uh, I remember we were down in San Diego to the old mission, uh, mission, uh, what do they call it? Mission Ballroom? Yeah. Out there by the water. Yeah, right. Uh, by Mission Bay. Right. And, uh, I remember we played on Pasadena, Pasadena Civic Auditorium. All dances for dances, big you know, crowds I, of people. I remember seeing Bob's band out here about that time. They played at the uh, Million Dollar Theater in, on, on Broadway in Los Angeles on a great big stage, and they must have had two or three programs that boy. He I had think a big uh, band I think that was the year before they were out here, forty one. Boy, they had a big band. Because we didn't we didn't play it uh, we didn't play that when I was out here in forty two. He had a band that was... But I don't remember we were out here too long, just uh, maybe 10 days, to make the record. I think we were supposed to make a picture, but it fell through or something. Mm -hmm. Maybe the war coming on did something to do with it. But uh, during this time, uh, did you, uh, did you uh, note uh, any influence as far as a, a comment has been made that they... Sort of incorporate a little bit of the uh, Bob Crosby Dixieland style of music. Did you know a little bit of, the, of that? <coughs> yeah, if you'll notice in 10 years, it had decidedly a Dixieland right. sound. The instrumental part, that was a, I would say that was the influence of the drummer and Benny Strickler and Woody Woods and some of the guys in the band that kind of leaned towards that type of jazz. But you know, Bob liked it. Yes, I understand. Bob thought Dixieland was just great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I said this George Bailey was quite an artist too, wasn't he? Yes, sir. He sounded like uh, he played tenor like uh, Eddie Miller. Mm -hmm. So there was decided uh, Bob Crosby influence in the band. Uh, of course, Bob Crosby was going real good then, and uh, we this, all liked him. This recording was made in Hollywood. Uh, that was uh, at the uh, CBS studio. Uh, Columbia. 
Yeah, Columbia it was Cl for Columbia Records. Right. Uh, okay, label. As I remember, we made that uh, at the old Melrose CBS Studios on Melrose, you know, near Gower. Right, right. I think that's where we made them. But Wayne Johnson definitely was not on. Was the not. He didn't come west with the van. Uh, they got in a hassle of something to do with the sex section. Um, there was a little quibble about that he wasn't blending with the other sexes correctly. And in a huff or something, one day he quit. Right. He, he went back to home. It seemed to me he lived up around Miami or, yeah. or uh, up northeastern. He was quite a good clarinet man, wasn't he? Well, uh, I got to be honest. Uh, Don Harlan was such a good first sax player, and Woody Woods was such a good third sax player, and Wayne was playing tenor, and they didn't think he played correct strong enough. I see. And they got to quibbling about it, and um, well, I don't want to get into that. Anyway. George Bailey replaced him. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, from your uh, from your time out here, then you went back to uh, to Tulsa. Yeah, I went back to Tulsa. Now, this is July of '42. Yes, July. Right. Then where did what happened after that? And boy, after that, uh, things started going downhill. Uh, the war was coming on, and. Then we began to lose a couple of men by the draft. Um, I think a couple of guys volunteered, uh, you know, enlisted. And uh, everyone just became suddenly conscious of the war, you know, that it was coming on and we all had to do something. In my case, I, uh, my wife had been back living with me in Tulsa and I sent her back to California. And uh, I felt like that, that uh, for my own personal thing, that I should get back to California where my wife was and, and get in some war work. I just felt like that playing in the band now was just superficial, that I should be doing something in the war effort. So that's why I quit the band. I came back to California. And, uh, but uh, it was just, the war broke it up. Right. I guess Bob then went into service too about. The, the yeah, uh, Bob got called in shortly after uh, we got back back there. I think right at about. Well, let's see. Here's the way it happened. I quit the band about August or September of forty. Of forty two, came back to California. I was out here, and then, but this time uh, the horn band had just about broke up. It had Benny and. Everybody left the band for one reason or another. But Bob came back to California in September with a nucleus of band. He brought uh, uh, Millard Kelso. Oh, wait a minute. i got to make a correction. When we on this on this broadcast, I was trying to name the correct person, I mean this record session, Al Strickland had gone back to Texas. Right, I didn't think Al We used... Uh, a little guy we call Skeeter on piano. Uh, Skeeter Hawkins? Uh, no. no. What the heck was his uh, name? He came along later. I but think I you mean. mentioned his name uh, uh, on our phone conversation the other day. But it wasn't. Al Strickland was not on this on this three-day record day. I'm sure I've got his name at home. I'll have to He's a little guy whose name was... Um, Odd name, Morse. Mm, I'm not sure, but I, 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 I'm sure I've got the name. No, but I, I want to make that correction right, right now. Al yeah, Strickland Al Strickland left not, the band. I think he recorded uh, the last session. I think he was with Bob is about uh, 41. 41, I think, when they did uh, old uh, Dusty Skies mm -hmm. and that series. There mm -hmm. was the last one. He was I think with you're Bob. right. Yes, 41. They made a record session out here in the summer of 41. And then the next, they didn't make any records because I was with them shortly after that. And they didn't record until July of 42. Right. 
and I hasten to make that correction. Al Strickland left the band and went back to Texas, I think, to get into some war work. <coughs> well, I was going to say, Bob came back out to uh, uh, California with just the nucleus of his band. I think uh, Leon McAuliffe had left the band then. We picked up a new steel player. And he had uh, Miller Kelso on piano. Um, can't remember who was playing drums then. But I remember he called me. He knew where I was. and wanted to know if I'd go to San Diego and play a couple of nights down there with him. And I was... And he, and he had me get a hold of a saxophone player, which I did. So we had trumpet and sax. I think Joe Holly and, and Bob were two fiddles and Kelso and, and a bass player, and I can't remember who it was. But we played some couple dances uh, before I finally... Still turned out the quits. crowd, didn't he? Big as ever. <laughs> I think we had about a 10-piece a band and... Uh, <laughs> There's thousands of people out there dancing. Uh, did uh, Tommy know. Duncan ever come back at all after you after he left? The yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he sure his did. His wife died along there somewhere, didn't yes, she? Yes, she did. Mm -hmm. He lost his wife. Uh, I can't remember exactly at what point it was before he went in the army or afterwards. Uh, Tommy wasn't in too long. I don't remember the reason. I think he got a medical discharge. But he was back with Bob, and then. Uh, they got back together again. Uh, I know uh, when I was in the Navy in 1943, Bob's band was playing down at Mission Beach. Mission Beach is over. So I went out to see him, and God, Bob was so good to me. Here I was in my sailor suit, and, and he brought me up to sing Home in San Antonio. And I remember I got a big hand because they remembered it. And uh, and Tom was back in the band, and I remember he came over and he says, "For God's sake, write me out that second set of lyrics." You know, there was two sets of lyrics. No, I and, uh, when I come back and sing the second time, it was a different set of oh, words. Right? He says, "For God's sake, write me out that second set of lyrics." People are driving me crazy saying I don't sing it like <laughs> it was on the record. <laughs> I thought but, he was a pretty nice guy, though. I thought. Oh, Prince. Uh, but you know, the first time uh, we made that record, uh, made that record session in 40, July 42, and do you know when I first heard that record? Yeah. I was out to sea yeah. on a ship in the South Pacific, and I was a radio man up in a radio shack, and one night we had the radio on, you know, from the States, and they played that record. I and I said, uh, turned to the guys in the radio shack, and I says, Jesus, that's me. And they looked at me and says, oh, come on. I said, yeah, that's, I, made, I, made, I made that record. And then the uh, next time we got back in the States, it was a big hit. Yeah. It was on all the jukeboxes right. and everything. Oh, it, it was a big hit, all right. I bet it was quite a thrill, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a good seller. Yeah. yeah good no, that's, that's the one thing I'm glad that I did get to sing one tune with Bob. Right. Uh, well, let's get on. Oh, uh, before yeah. I leave the subject, yes. uh, you know, I work at Disney Studio now, and uh, we just finished a, a feature-length cartoon a picture called The Aristocrats, and we had a premiere last Friday. And so uh, I went out to see it, took my wife and daughter, and went with a friend of mine who scored the picture. And we were talking to Glenn Campbell. He was there in the lobby. And a uh, very nice guy, yes. beautiful person. So I says, well, I'm an old uh, timer at this Western Music. I used to sing with Bob Wills. Glenn says, the hell you did. And I says, yeah, I made the record of Home in San Antonio. And Glenn says, you did. Haven't got to worry. He says, I know it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Glenn was quite a fan of Bob Wills. You know? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, even today, the young Western singers today uh, all admit that Bob was the forerunner of hey, Bob and Tom. Of good country and western music. Uh, let's pick up your career now. After you have uh, come out of the service, you come out of the service at about what time? 
Uh, I got out in 45, November 45, and uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, uh, in fact, I didn't do anything for about six months. I laid around the house. You know, you come out of the service and you're she used there one time you what to do that, you know, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And, uh, and, uh, I didn't think I wanted to go back with Bob. I didn't ask him whether he wanted me or not. But, uh, oh, I don't know. I didn't think we could pick up like it used to be. So, uh, in the meantime, I I had learned, before the war, I had learned, uh, before I went with Bob, I'd learned the uh, fingerprint technique. I knew fingerprints. I went to school and learned it. And even before I went to the Navy, I did some fingerprint work up at uh, Utah, in Salt Lake City. But, uh, so, I finally decided I'd go to work for the police department in fingerprints. And I figured I wouldn't play anymore. So, uh, I worked about a year and a half with the, with the um, L.A. Police Department Civil Service as a fingerprint technician. And didn't touch my horn, didn't play for a year or so. And then I was laying home one night listening to the radio, and I heard uh, a Western band over the radio coming live from somewhere out, some place out south. And it was T. Texas Tyler and his band. And uh, I heard him say, uh, play it, Don. And there was an old friend of mine, a fiddle player named Don. Uh, can't call his last name right now. I said, yeah, I think I'll go out and see old Don. So I drove out there, and here's another one of these things. <laughs> And Don says, you got your horn, go get it. <laughs> so I said, in, I got hired. <laughs> so, so I was back in the Western Venice again. And I played about two two or three years with T. Texas Tyler. Uh, who would have been with the band at the time you joined your crowd? Well, let me see. We had um, two fiddle players, uh, Don, I'll think of his last name in a minute. And I had uh, Buddy Ray from Waco, Texas, good fiddle player. Um... Uh, had a blind boy called Jimmy Pruitt playing piano. He's pretty active around town now. And had a drummer. Can't recall his name. He wasn't with us very long. We changed. I later got Monty Montjoy in the band. Um, and uh, the more one of the Morgan family. You were the Morgan family. You know, J.P. Morgan, singer. Well, there's a whole raft of brothers and sisters of them. They all... This is Bob Morgan played bass. They had a brother, Charlie Morgan, Duke Morgan, all, all played good Western music. But uh, we had a pretty romping band. Played out the uh, Riverside Rancho. And then as I so began to play... About 48? Mm-hmm, 40, 46, 47, 48. That's about the heyday of uh, the Spade Cooley band. Yeah, uh, you know Spade called me up. Shortly after I got back from the war, and when he started his big band, he knew I'd worked with Bob, you know, offered me a job uh, with him. But uh, to me, his band didn't have that thing that Bob Wilt's big band had, and uh, I said I didn't think I wanted to play with him. So I didn't. Uh, were you impressed with uh, T. Texas Tyler as a man and an entertainer? Well, I'll tell you, Tex could have gone big if he'd have used his head, I always thought, but... Uh, well, I uh, I was with him on Texas, one of the first guys after the war to get a sponsored TV Western show over old KTTV. This was, were you around town then? Oh, yes. And uh, and we had a chance to, uh, had a good deal all set up to go, sponsored by McMahon Furniture. And was already signed the contract in Texas. Well, what if I want to go away on a band trip? <laughs> and they blew up and wouldn't sign it. And he blew that. Well, we made a lot of band trips. He used to go up in the Northwest a lot. Well, you know, you Northern ever, California, Washington, Oregon. Did you ever record with him? Yeah. Right. Oh, God, yeah. He used to record on Four Star. But you were on number his recording. Yeah, I, I played with him on his um, uh, deck of cards. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. Well, Played the background on that. Did you ever uh, vocal on any? No, no. Tex did all the vocals. But I wrote several songs that Tex did. Oh, is that right? 
Uh, not all of them hit, so uh, good night, Waltz. Uh, please believe me. Um, I'll hate myself tomorrow for loving you tonight, which I always thought was a keen tune. But, uh, then I wrote some things with Tex. We shared some things. Uh, of course, Tex's biggest hit was Remember Me. Yes, Remember Me. But he made that, he, I didn't make that with him. He that he had that going before I was with him. But uh, he did real well on Deck of Cards. It was a big one. Yes, it was. And so you were uh, I, I ran the band for him. I was his manager. I had all these, like I said, I had all these tricks of Bob's boy, and I, uh, I instilled them in text because he didn't know a damn thing about running the band, dance band. So the way he used to work... Uh, uh, well, I could make a band trip. Why? I'd run the band. Uh, we'd play for about the first 20 minutes, and then Tex would come on and sing his specialties for the last 20 minutes, and then it'd be an intermission. But I managed the band, collected all the money, paid all the guys, took care of the whole work. Was uh, Tex an easy man to work for? A very easy man to work for. He was Tex was really a a nice guy. He just he didn't have any business sense, and uh, he's lazy. Right. So you joined he him thought about, things would come easy for him. You joined him about 48 and was with him to about 1950. Uh, no, I, I was with him earlier than that. I, was, I started working with him while I was doing fingerprint work. Oh, I see. And that's a funny thing. We started working uh, oh, three or four nights a week out there at Riverside Rancho, which used to be down at, on Riverside oh, near yes. Los Feliz. Oh, yes. And, uh, oh, we did well. It was a nice ballroom there. It used to be the old breakfast club. Uh, and we did we did very well then until uh, I was playing about four nights a week down there and working days down at the police department. And uh, I was going downhill, boy. Yeah. Uh, I was really good. So I, I said, I got to I gotta do one or the other. So I figured, well, I can always work fingerprints. So I quit the fingerprint job. I said, I'll just devote my time to music now. And you know what happened? <laughs> the next night after I quit the police department, the Riverside Rancho burned down. Yeah. <laughs> and then I didn't have any job. Bob Wills used to come in there quite often and spade yeah. and mm -hmm. Tex spade, Williams. Tex Williams. There. Mm -hmm. Hank Penny. Mm -hmm. It's true. Uh, then uh, we started going, making a lot of road trips. Oh, we made a trip down through Texas. Uh, Tex got a real good very successful. Uh, like I say, uh, Texas have been on the ball and uh, tried a little harder. Uh, he might have made it real well. Well, let's see. What was the uh, period now that you would have been with him to try to... Uh, I would say I was with him from about the spring of 46, you know, like March or February, until... Uh, 49, darn near three years. Okay. And the reason I quit him was that um, I just didn't want to make any more road trips. We were just uh, making so many trips. I was away from home, the wife, and, and uh, I decided I didn't want to do it anymore. Where'd you go from there? Then I uh, decided I'd. Uh, get into day work and I got to no no about that time I joined the firehouse five plus two there was a bunch of guys that uh, worked over Disney studio and uh, and they just wanted to play for fun or occasionally you know and they dressed up in fire costumes and uh, and played Dixieland jazz kind of style so I said yeah I'd like to do that so I did, and I made one record session with them, and then, uh, and then this company that started a record session was wanted to start a wholesale record distributors and take on a lot of other labels. So I got a job working days with this, and and grew up with a distributorship, and it turned into a darn good job. I was selling and playing with the Firehouse Five. Uh, do you recall the names of the people that, uh, that you first joined? Mm -hmm. Who was the leader at that time? I was Ward Kimball, who's now director over at Disney Studios.
And who else would have been? Uh, these were names clear outside of the Western field and clear outside of professional music. As a matter of fact, they were mostly writers and directors over oh, there. Just right? like to play for a hobby. Oh, I see. All uh, guys with good jobs over there. But there, here was the band you probably heard of. Us, oh, so we yes. Indeed. Caught on real fast and... Uh, and uh, one of the first things that helped us off, we got to playing every Monday night out to Macombo, where they kind of revived the uh, Charleston era and the Dixieland. And uh, God, we went up fast. And we was on the Bing Crosby shows and Milton Berle show. Went back to New York for the Milton Berle show, the Ed Wynn show. And, and then we was getting demand for dances and things, and mostly on weekends. And then I had my day job going. And, so I was doing fine. So I played with a band from 40, 49 to 55. In the meantime, this company, a record company I'd gone with, the distributors, it grew up fast and was very successful. And then uh, Ward Kimball says, why don't you come out to Disney and go to work? So we'll all be together. And I says, well, I can't draw. And he said, well, there's a lot of jobs. So I went to work out there in the music department. I later worked my way down into an animation unit where I'm assistant director now, and that's what I've been doing for the last 16 years. How would you ever fit it into that? Is that I don't know. I uh, I just got over there and learned the business. Is it interesting? Oh, yeah, it's a beautiful place to work. Yeah. Now, uh, any particular name that uh, was with the group uh, during this period of time uh, that would uh, stand out? In other words, did, was it re more or less restricted just to the people at the Disney Studios, and did you sort of keep it a small group within mm -hmm. the... Yeah, it was always remained a seven-piece band. Right. We called ourselves the Firehouse Five Plus Two. Right, but did you bring anybody in from the outside the well, studio? Well, uh, later we did. Uh, Originally, when I, went, when I first went with the band, everyone in the band, except me, worked at Disney Studio. Mm -hmm. And then later on, I did, and then we all did for a while. And then uh, tuba player passed away. Then we got an outsider outside the studio. Then the banjo player dropped out, and then we got an outsider banjo player. Uh, we've changed about four men during the 20 years we've been together. Is that right? That's very, well, give us the names of the uh, the band at its peak. In other words, when would, what would have been the peak year? I think the peak is right now. Right now. got the you, best band we ever had right, right now. Now, are you as much in demand now as you were saying? We're in demand, but we don't, uh, everyone's kind of phasing out. I see. We don't, they don't want to, Ward Kimball is the leader, and he's very busy at City, he's a, animation director and quite busy and so he turns down an awful lot of things. Uh, who else would be the group? Well, Ward Kimball is the leader and chief he as plays, we call uh, it, trombone. trombone. I play cornet. Uh, the saxophone player is, he formerly worked at Disney but now he works over at Paramount. He's a music cutter, music editor. He plays soprano sax. The uh, drummer is Eddie Forrest, who's an outsider, although years ago he worked at Disney. Now he's retired, but he likes to play drums. We're all, none of us are chickens anymore. We're all 50 or older. Billy Newman, a banjo player, he's, a, he's, a, he's an outsider, but he's a copyist and arranger, does a lot of commercials and things. Uh, the tuba player is a Disney guy. Uh, he's George Bruns. He composes and scores pictures over there. He wrote the ballad of David Crockett. Oh, is it? And uh, among other things, very, very talented person. But he just likes to play for fun. He don't need the money. No. But he just likes to play. And the piano player is K.O. Eklund. He's a layout artist at the Los Angeles Times newspaper. Mm -hmm. So actually, there's only three of us at Disney anymore. What about the ones that have dropped out? What names would they and what would they Well, be? Clark Mallory was the original clarinet player, and he was an animator, but he, he left Disney, and he's animating at some other studio now, and I haven't seen him in years. Good player. Uh, original tuba player passed away. Banjo player. The second banjo player we had passed away. Uh... 
the original piano player, Frank Thomas, he's an animator at Disney. He just uh, didn't have time to play anymore and dropped out. That's why I picked up K.O.A. <laughs> so that's been my music for the last uh, 20 years, playing with the Firehouse Five and working at Disney. And I'm very happy and very how often, pleased about everything. How do you get? How often do you get together and play? Uh, words, we only get together when we play a job. We never rehearse. Yeah, I know, but uh, how how often will you get out? Once well, a week? Uh, we, well, we used to average about 85 or 90 jobs a year, which for just a hobby man was pretty good. That was almost twice, twice a week. But now it's probably half of that. I would play 40 jobs a week. Do you, a year. Do you uh, get a big kick out of it when you do get out? Still like to play, Ken. Yeah. Still like to play. And you know what? We play a lot of Western tunes. Do you? Sure. Like, uh, God, the other night we played, this last Saturday night, we played up at China Lake up by Ridgecrest for the Naval Weapons Center up there. You know, a big Navy base. We played San Antonio. Is that right? And uh, gee, a lot of a lot of good Western tunes make good uh, good dance tunes. Like yeah. we play, have you ever been lonely? Uh, I can't think of many right now, but uh, I still throw in some Bob Wills too. <laughs> Do you get people from down and that recognize the name as being so? Yeah, good? you know, I I come up with, run across people that uh, that want to know if I'm the Danny Allgaard. That was with Bob Will. Is that right? Yeah. Well, that's quite a compliment. You know what? I just happen to think something. I've never sang Home in San Antonio and Far House Five. I think we'll do it so much. <laughs> you why not? I, I never thought of it. No, as you uh, think back of uh, your uh, association with country music, uh, do you ever feel that... Uh, Perhaps you missed something by not getting into that field earlier than you did, or do you feel that it's worked out just as well the way you forget? Well, uh, right now, there's just no place for a trumpet in a Western band. No, but I'm talking about in the past. Well, as, well like, uh, reviewing back what I always talked about, you know what I did? I, I grew up not in Western music, then got into it and went through a beautiful phase of it, and then got back out of it again, and went back in it. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you one thing, I'm, one of the most beautiful periods of my life was the was the year, almost a full year that I worked with Bob Wills Band. I'll never forget it. The association with with beautiful, honest people, and, uh, and the sincerity of Bob, and, and Bob personally was a wonderful man. You really did enjoy it. I'll never forget. I was I was only in the band about two weeks or something. Uh, we were getting ready to play on a job somewhere at Keynes Academy in Tulsa. And I was fooling around with one of my valves and my trumpet. It was sticking. And I remember Bob coming over and he said, What's the matter, Dan? I says, Well, this valve sticking. It's not working very good. And the horn's not too new. And he says, well, why don't you go down and buy yourself a new horn tomorrow, and I'll pay for it. And that was one of the first things that impressed me about Bob. Yeah. I thought, gee. And I'll tell you something else that not many people know. I don't know whether you've ever heard it, but I must throw it in. We were on a set salary, but every week in our paycheck, in our pay envelope, there was a bonus in there for us. Is that right? Bob would always slip in an extra 20 or 30 if things had gone well. So he paid good for that time. Uh, you were paying, uh, probably paying scale? Paying oh, yes, it was scale. Uh, I, I think the basic pay was 50, 60 bucks a week, but uh, it would be 80, 90 bucks in that paycheck. Well, this is pretty good money for you know, 41, that's four salaries begin to ooch up, you know. What, what would you imagine Tommy was drawing in that, that time? I don't know. I just have to guess that he was getting probably twice as much as the rest of us, I'm sure. Well, Bob treated Tom real good. Oh, Tom might have been making a couple hundred a week then, for all I know. Be my guess. Well, Bob made Because uh, 
Tom was a big help to Bob on the way up. Right. He was part of the band, boy. He was a, a sound of the band. Right. Well, and Leon McAuliffe, too, on steel, was a was a big help to Bob. Bob had the guys. He sure did. He had some quality performers. You know, I guess some, Leon and Tommy were really an integral part of the They were all band, you know? come up together, you know. It was all part of the band. I mean, Tom was, was Bob Wills and Leon McAuliffe was Bob Wills and Al Strickland was Bob Wills. It had that Bob Wills sound. They were. That's what made the the sound of a band is only made up with the people that's in it. You uh, one song that Bob recorded uh, about 1938. Uh, it's one of my favorites. And Tommy sings on it. It's uh, the waltz you saved for me. I don't know if you ever heard it or not. I didn't know they made a record of it. Yeah, and it has the saxes. It opens up with saxes. Tax section? Yeah. I I never did get to hear all those things all the Bob made. Uh, I know in that era, just about oh, two or three years before I was in the band, you know, when they had Tubby Lewis and Zeb and, now, did, and Stover was, and those things. Excuse me now, was, was Zeb McNally with, with the band when you were there? No, uh, he had no. left. Right, he had left. Well, why did, did you ever hear why Zeb left the band? No, never did. <clears throat> I think they were... Uh, as I say, the session, uh, the record session they made before I went in the band must have been out here in the summer of 41, you know, when Benny Strickland went back with them. And uh, that's when they made those tunes you mentioned a while ago, Dusty Skies, and, and I think they made... Uh, oh, Cherokee Maiden was mm -hmm. the one. Cherokee Maiden. It had... Uh, uh, yeah, uh-huh. It had some horns on it. Right. Uh, and other things, I think Jamie McIntosh was on, and uh, Tubby Lewis. Tubby Lewis was on Big Beaver, I know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he did the trumpet solo on Big Beaver. That's he a, was a good player. Yeah. And I, I never, oh, he died. I think he did so many. He died, died shortly died. after. Eric Stover's gone, Louis Turney's gone. There was two trumpets on uh, San Antonio Rose. Ever Stover was one of them, but there was two trumpets. I don't know who the other one would have been. Maybe uh, mm -hmm. Tubby Lewis, for all I know. Could have been. I don't know whether Tubby and Everett played at the same time or not. Well, I think you've had a, an extremely interesting uh, career, uh, Danny, and uh, I, uh, I I have to agree with you about your feelings toward the uh, Bob Wills era. I think it was a, uh, a real big thing in, in the country western field, and I guess we'll never see the likes of another Bob Wills, you know. I think if the war hadn't come along, but, but that band would have turned into uh, a band as nationally prominent as say Welk is today. I'd say so. He uh, drew. See, I think Bob was moving towards that end. You know, Welk started out as just a polka band, yes. six-piece polka band, and and grew into this. And I, and like I say, I think Bob always wanted to to move up in that direction. You think so? Yeah, I do. Well, and not forsaking yeah. the Western sound or anything, yeah. but I just think Bob thought that he could get the sound he wanted and play anything for any amount of any people if he had the men that could do it, and which is what Welk is doing today. Right. He does have. You know, Welk. Uh, you got to give him credit, boy. He. Oh, he sure does. He, he's similar to Bob in many ways. He seems to have a sense of knowing what people right. want and how to please the people. He plays Bob the had people. that sense. And I think if the war hadn't come along, we were all, oh, this band was well knit and was playing so well together. And uh, boy, it had, a, it had a sound, I'll tell you. And I just I just say if the war hadn't come along, this band would, I don't know how long it would go or how far it would have gone. Well, they were outdrawing, outdrawing a lot of the big bands of that era. They were sure drawing was. more people than the... You than remember, those. I think it was 1941... Bob Wills had the biggest income of any band leader in the United States that year. Is that I didn't right? know you knew that. Statistic. No, I didn't. Know. No. It's true. I would imagine that Bob he... Bob made a lot of money. Yes, he's made millions, I guess. And blew a lot of it. Yeah. But he was very generous with people. And people very generous. He, he had a lot of relatives that used to come yeah. up to Kane's Academy to pick up money. And Bob never turned them down. He took care of his kinfolk. 
Well, Dan, we want to thank you very much for taking time to uh, talk with us, and uh, I know this is a valuable addition to the uh, archives at the foundation, and uh, we hope uh, that your career will continue on to be as successful as it has been. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure, and I want to compliment you on uh, and tell you how gratified I am uh, that uh, you're doing the work you're doing. I think it's, a, it's something that should be done, and uh, anything any of us can do to set down the record or preserve uh, the uh, country music uh, and uh, particularly all the musicians that made it possible is a great work. Well, I'm uh, glad you're doing it. I thank you. I have to send a copy of this tape back to my good friend uh, Glenn White in Oklahoma City. Glenn's a real Bob Wills fan and he's quite an astute student of Bob's music and, and he'll be very uh, enthused uh, listening to your comments and he'll probably come back with a if list If I of said questions. anything wrong he'll know it won't he? <laughs> well yes I don't think you said anything wrong but he will uh, uh, think of several questions I'm sure that he will want me to put to you and so when I hear from Glenn maybe I'll give you a call and get some answers for him because he uh, he really digs the Bob Will story and uh, I'm sure he will be wanting to know what you thought of this and that and so I hope to get a chance to talk to you again with these yeah. soon. Well, I'll be glad to help. Thanks so much, Dan. Thanks for watching my video. Click on the button below here and go to my website, www.exploringthepast.net.